Thank you. <laughs> this is great. <laughs> I like it. Oh, I love it too. Hello, everybody. <laughs> the music that you have just heard is entitled Kwe Bozingen, and it is composed by the 19th century nomad uh, composer Sugir, depicting a female camel's trot while looking for his lost calf. And we want to thank uh, one of our editors of uh, Amana Zaure, Zaure uh, Batayeva for actually suggesting all right, this piece of music, which makes use of the Kazakhstani string instrument, the Dombaira, all right, which is an instrument that recurs all right, in many of the stories in the anthology, Amanat. Welcome, everybody. My name is uh, Ji Leong Ko. I'm the publisher and editor-in-chief of Gaudy Boy which is an independent literary press based in New York City and Singapore. And we are so proud to hold this launch event for Amanat Women's Writing from Kazakhstan, re-edited by Shelley uh, Fairweather Vega and Zaure uh, Batayeva. Uh, we have here uh, Shelley, uh, the editor, who will speak to us in a minute and three contributors to the anthology who will be reading to you and they will be engaged in a conversation afterwards with uh, our moderator, uh, Naomi Caffey. And we also would like to invite questions from all of you uh, about you know, the anthology, if you have already read the anthology and want to know more about the anthology or questions based on what you will hear in just one moment. You may put your questions in the chat box, all right, where Naomi can see them. And then we will, of course, try to respond to as many questions, as many of your questions as we can. Just a few more words about Gaudi Boy. As we said, we are a New York City-based literary press. We started in 2018, and our mission is to publish poetry, fiction, and literary nonfiction uh, by authors of Asian heritage from around the world. Now, we regard the term Asia in a very expansive manner. Uh, and really, part of this expansion, I think, is beautifully accomplished through our publication of Amana, uh, because it really does expand many of our common ideas about Asia. 
since Central Asia is not an area we normally associate with Asia, and certainly there are not enough translations of Central Asian literature. So we are so pleased and proud to actually collaborate with the editors and translators and the writers of this anthology to bring you this really fantastic and important collection of stories. Kimberly Lim, my managing editor, has just put a link all right, to the page, to the book page. So if you haven't had a chance to check it out, please click on the link and read the description of the, uh, uh, of the anthology. And you may want to, by the end of this event, avail yourself of a copy. All right, not based, maybe not just for yourself, but for your friends and family as well. And maybe even consider teaching it in your classrooms. And certainly consider inviting the editors as well as the contributors uh, to your schools, to your institutions, uh, to speak to your own audiences. All right. Um, that's a lot of introduction. I'm sorry to go on. But right now, I just want to introduce you, uh, first of all, uh, Shelley, uh, uh, one of the two editors, translators of these of this anthology. Uh, Shelley Fairweather Vega is a professional translator of Russian and Uzbek. She's based in Seattle, Washington. She translates poetry, fiction, screenplays, and more for authors around the world with a special focus on the contemporary literature of Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan. Her published projects and work in progress can be found at fairvega.com backslash translation. I give you Shelley Fairweather Vega. Thank you so much, G, and thank you everyone who's here. It's so nice to see you, um, all your smiling faces and all those copies of the book that you're holding up. Um, I'm just really, really excited that Amanat is a real book in the world now and that we get to celebrate it today. Um, Amanat is the first anthology of its kind, um, as um, other people have said before me. Um, and it's a first for me as well. Um, I've translated plenty of other books, stories, poets, but never such a large collection of so many different types of, of writing. Um, and it's been a great experience for me personally. Um, first of all, because I discovered all these wonderful writers, um, three of whom are here with us today. Um, and I've learned how much writing is out there in Kazakhstan and how much um, really demands sort of our attention and our consideration in, in the English speaking world and for larger audiences than, than it can get at home in Kazakhstan. And of course, translation is the tool we use to, to get access to those, um, those, those stories. Uh, so it's really an honor for me to be a part of that process. It was also a great experience for me working on Amanat um, because I got to work so closely with Sarai Vatayeva, um, my co-editor and, and co-translator of these stories. Um, Sarai translated all the Kazakh, all the originally Kazakh um, pieces in this, in this uh, collection where I was responsible for the, for the English ones. So we had a third translator too, Sam uh, Brazil, who's here on the on the call, I saw your face a minute ago, Sam. Sam, um, at the last minute, chipped in one of his translations of R.L. or kind of a stories, um, which we really appreciate. Um, Zare could not be here with us today, but she asked me to read um, something she wrote, her thoughts about Amanat, so I'll do that real quickly here. Um, Zare says, the Soviet Union produced very few women writers. No doubt this was due to the gender policy of the USSR. As a result, we Kazakhs grew up admiring the male authors of grandiose Soviet epic novels and poems. Only in the 2000s, a decade after the collapse of the Soviet Union, did the voices of women writers become more prominent in Kazakhstan. Most of these writers had grown up in the USSR and had had a Soviet education, and they did not find the necessary creative freedom until much later. Unfortunately, uh, Zarei writes, holding to the old Soviet habit, literary institutions of Kazakhstan even today still don't provide any significant support to women writers. Yet, women writers keep creating and writing and finding new ways to reach their readers. Zarei says she's proud to be a part of this anthology as a translator and as a contributor. Um, two of Zarei's own stories are also part of the anthology. And she's proud to have succeeded, she says, in something that no one would have thought possible a few years ago. Was it worth the wait? Now that this anthology, so ably produced by the whole team at Gaudi Boy, lies before us, it is impossible to think otherwise. But what makes me proudest, uh, as Zare says, is that we have recovered these stories from the passage of time and have given them a new platform that they would not have found in their own country. May this anthology find its audience. And she sends best wishes to everyone here. So I can only agree with everything that Zare wrote um, in her statement. Um, and, 
I'll tell you a little bit about the, the history of Amanat before we get on to the, the really good part of this meeting. Um, this uh, anthology really was Zare's idea from the start. She approached me for help editing one of her translations from Kazakh into English uh, several years ago. And that was um, Ayagul Kamalbayeva's novella, The Nanny, which is ex excerpted here in Amanat as um, the story Hunger. Um, soon after we did that project, Zare had more stories for me to look at. And soon after that, uh, Susan Harris at Words Without Borders took The Nanny and two other of our translations um, for publication and made a whole uh, small feature of um, women's writing from Kazakhstan. Um, with that, Zare knew and I that we were onto something, we had to keep going. And eventually, um, aside from those three stories in Words Without Borders, um, we've collected um, stories by a total of 13 women uh, writing um, in Kazakhstan, in Russian, and in Kazakh, in all kinds of styles, different lengths from different eras, um, but mostly within the past uh, 30 years since, um, since independence. Eventually, Gaudi Boy, uh, much to our uh, great good fortune, came, came to us looking for Central Asian literature and translation for their Singapore Unbound blog, which I recommend to everybody here. Singapore Unbound published Zare's translation of Jumagul Solti's Romeo and Juliet, the first book in our first uh, story in our book. Um, and soon enough, they decided they'd like to publish our whole collection. Um, it's been such a pleasure. Um, and sorry, I know and I are both so thankful for the opportunity to work with Gaudi Boy um, and then all of their different projects. They do great work. I recommend you check out their website and all the other things that they publish. Um, They've shown us so much appreciation and understanding um, for our writers, for our translations, and they've offered so many smart questions and helpful comments throughout the process. Um, I want to thank especially uh, Sam, who's here, um, for his extra translation for us, everyone who's published excerpts for us, provided uh, blurbs already, who's already purchased the book and kind of cheered us on throughout this process, um, and everyone who started reading and telling me how much they're enjoying the stories. So I really look forward to our conversation today. Um, it's time now to start introducing uh, the writers, the real stars of Amanat. Um, first up, we're going to have Aral Arukineva. Um, she's a poet, literary critic, and translator. Aral studied the German language and Almaty and business management in Hamburg, Germany. Her stories, poems, and articles have been published in literary journals in Kazakhstan, Russia, Germany, and the United States, including uh, Brooklyn Rail, um, a poem. Um, Aral is fluent in four languages, at least, that I know of. Um, but she writes in both Kazakh and in Russian. Um, Aral has three stories in Amanat, two and four in By Her Time in Big Business, um, and one of which was translated by, by Sam. Um, and the third one is the, the story that gave Amanat its title, the story Amanat, um, which I think Aral is going to read some of now, and then I'll read um, the first bit of the English translation of it. Mm -hmm. Hello, everybody uh, from all over the world. Mm -hmm. um, Nice to meet you. Um, I am really excited to be part of this incredible project. And first of all, I would like um, uh, to thank uh, Zauri Bataeva, uh, who has initiated this anthology uh, back in 2018, as far as I recall. And uh, the, I think Zauri did a great job of selecting authors and works for the anthology and translating them. I'm grateful to Shelley, <laughs> uh, who continuously promotes Kazakh writing and Kazakh writers by translating in the, and publishing our works in the US. Uh, I think Shelley is actually the person uh, who, uh, who made this event happen. Um, uh, thank you very much to Godi Publishing uh, for this amazing book. And I know there is uh, one more translator uh, who worked on my translations, uh, Sim Brazil, uh, if I'm not wrong. Thank you to Sam as well. Um, uh, I, uh, this, uh, as Shelley said, uh, this is the first anthology of Kazakh woman writing and published abroad in English. And, um, and it's an honor for me uh, uh, to be in the same list of writers with Lila Kalaus, with Asiel Omar, uh, Zira Nourizbaeva and others. Uh, I, I'm sure 
that this book certainly opened the way for us to the English speaking readers. And that's wonderful. Uh, now I am going to read an excerpt from my novel Amanat in Kazakh. And uh, then uh, Shelley will read translation in English. Thank you. Uh, Amanat. Бірнеше ай бойы ауырып жатқан майра бір күні таң атпай оянып, кенже ұлы жалғасты шақырды. Бірақ оның орына тұңғышы балтабай жет келді. Жалғас қайда? деп сұрады кен бір қарлыққан дауыз бен. Қазір келеді? деп жұбат шешесін балтабай. Қайда? Өз аман ба? деп бір демде сергелденге түсті майра. Бет сұрланып, Қиналып сөйле алмай қалды да, кетпе дегендей қолының қолына жармасты. Мама, жалғас қазір келеді. Жана ғана ол мен телефон арқылы сөйлестім, деп балтабай бос қолымен қалтасынан телефонын алып, қоңырау шалды. Сосын оның шешесінің құлағына жақындатып жатып, «Алло, жалғас, тұтқаны мамаға бердім», деді. Арғы жақтан, «Айттым қой кешке кіріп шығамы деген жалғастың ашушан дауысы естілді де байланыс бізіліп кетті. Е, дауысын естідім, оған да тәуға, деп майраның жүзі жайланып, көзінен жасы дұмылай берді. Балтабай үндемеген күйі оның жанында отырып қалды. Майра біраз күш жина балып, сосын оны үнемдегендей асықпай сөйлей бастады. Балам, Саған тапсыратын аманатын бар еді. О не дегеніңіз, мама? Жазылып кетесіз, деп балтабай анасының қолынан сипалады. Сөзімді бөлме, деген майраның қат құлдау дауысы оның бір ойға бекінген кейбін аңқарты бөтті. Азғантай деймін алған сон, жалғасты өз түтініне қайтарып, мұна үйдің орнына жаңа үй салып бер. Қазақтың бір тәуір қызына үйлендіріп, ана албастыдан босатып ал, деді. Аманатын тапсырған майра біраздан сон жанында тапсырды. So that's it. Thank you. So nice to hear that Kazakh. Yeah. Right. Here's a Zare's English translation of that much of the story. Аманат. Bedridden for several months, Myra woke up at dawn one day and called for her youngest son, Jalgas. It was her eldest son, Baltabai, who came to her bedside instead. Where's Jalgas? asked the old woman in a hoarse voice. He'll come soon, Baltabai consoled his mother. Will he? Is he all right? Myra, instantly worried, grabbed her son's hand as if asking him to stay. Jalgas will come soon. I've just spoken to him, Baltabai said, taking his phone out of his pocket. Baltabai called a number and spoke loudly while holding the phone to his mother's ear. Hello, Jalgas, I've given the phone to Mama. I've already told you I'll come by this evening, an angry voice shouted back, and the connection was cut. I heard his voice, thanks to God, said Myra, tears flowing down her face. She gathered strength and addressed Baltabai. Son, I have an amanat, she began. What are you saying, Mama? You will recover, Baltabai said, caressing her hand. Don't interrupt me, Myra said, and had to rest for a few minutes before she could continue. Build a new house for Zalgas. Find him a nice Cossack girl and save him from that albasti of a girlfriend he has. Myra died that evening. Thank you. Oh, I'm still up. We have uh, our next story. Um, our next writer is Lilia Klaus. Uh, Lilia is joining us from Almaty, where it's five o'clock in the morning. Thank you, Lilia. Um, Lilia is a graduate of Kazakh State University. She is a truly multi-talented artist. She writes fiction and essays. She paints. She has been a radio presenter, a teacher, and a publisher. Lilia has written poetry, novels, and children's adventure stories, but her preferred genre has always been the comical short story. Um, and several of these appear in our anthology, Amanat. Lilia writes in Russian, and we have um, Orala Rukinova, who you just heard from, um, who has kindly volunteered to translate for her um, today during this event. So 
Илья, пожалуйста, вам слово. Здравствуйте все еще раз. Я очень рада присутствовать на этой встрече. И, конечно, я очень благодарна издателям Шелли за возможность публикации в замечательной антологии Амана. Good morning, everybody. I'm happy to be here. Thank you very much to Gordy Publishing and to Shelley for this possibility to be published in this amazing anthology. Я подготовилась к этой встрече и кое-что написала, и мне бы хотелось прочитать сейчас этот текст. Этот текст посвящен тому, что позже будет прочитано на английском языке. I have prepared some text and I'd like to read it before I start with my excerpt. Прыгнуть с железным парашютом. To jump with an iron parachute. Я бы хотела рассказать об этом тексте лестницы, как он появился и почему. Так получилось, что вся моя жизнь, детская и взрослая, связана с одним и тем же домом. Я поселилась с ним маленькой девочкой, росла, училась, гуляла с друзьями, возвращалась домой нашу маленькую для четырех людей двухкомнатную квартиру, которая казалась мне большой как мир. Mm -hmm. I would like to tell you about my text Staircase, how and why it appeared. All my life, as a child and as an adult, I have been living in the same house. My family, consisting of four people, settled in it when I was a little girl into a small apartment with two rooms where I grew up, studied, spent time with my friend, and it seemed to me, to me as big as the world. Потому что она вся была наполнена книгами. Книги собирал мой отец, врач-стоматолог. Тогда в советские времена хорошие книги были дефицитом. Он покупал их тайком и частенько переплачивал. Мама была недовольна. Но еще больше ее печалило осознание того, что я отдала свою душу и, кажется, тело чтения. Um, uh, because uh, it seemed to me as big as the world because it was full of books. My father, a dentist, collected books. During Soviet times, good books were in short supply. However, my father managed to buy them secretly and often, and often overpaid. Mom was unhappy. Uh, but what made her more unhappy was the fact that I have devoted my soul and it seems my body to reading. И так хотелось иметь стройную яркую дочку, деловую, как тогда говорили, которая выберет себе богатого и крутого парня под стать и подарит моей мамочке кучу зубастых внуков. Да, моя мама тоже была врачом-стоматологом. Увы, вместо этого ей досталась толстая девочка в очках и с вечной книгой в руках. Uh, she wanted to uh, so she wanted so much to have a slender bright daughter business like as they said then who would choose a rich and tough guy to match and provide my mom a bunch of grandchildren with healthy teeth yes my mother was also a dentist dentist alas instead she got a fat girl wearing glasses with a book in her hands к тому же я поступила на филфак, факультет невесты, мама почти перестала надеяться. Но эта история случилась в ФПН. Дело в том, что иногда очень редко на филфак все же поступают мальчики. Мой муж никогда не признается в этом, но кажется, библиотека моего папы оказалась решающим фактором, определившим наше совместное будущее. И он тоже носит очки, как и наши дети. Очки и книги – вот то, что сделало нашу семью. In addition, I entered the philological faculty, the faculty of brides, and my mother almost lost any hope. However, this story had a happy end. The fact is that sometimes, very rarely, boys choose the philological faculty. My husband will never admit it, but it seems my dad's library was the deciding factor of our marriage. Uh, and my husband also wears glasses, like our children. Glasses and books make our family. Но вернемся к лестнице. Главным подарком родителей к нашей свадьбе стала квартира в том же доме, в том же подъезде, только этажом выше. И моя жизнь в том самом доме продолжилась. Но постепенно я стала тосковать. Мне казалось, что я застряла между вторым и третьим томом эпопеи Толстого «Война и мир». Ничего не двигалось, не происходило, не менялось. Я думала, боже, проклятая лестница, ненавидела ее. Я бегала по ней, когда была девочкой, потом девушкой, теперь хожу взрослой дамой. 
а потом меня понесут по ней, когда я умру с самого пятого этажа в гробу, а она будет все такой же унылой и глупой, ненавистой. Mm -hmm. If coming back to the staircase, the main gift from the parents for our wedding was an apartment in the same house, only one floor above it. So my life in the same house continued and gradually I began yearning. It seemed to me that I was stuck between the second and third volumes of Tolstoy epic War and Peace. Nothing moved, nothing happened, nothing changed. I thought, my God, the dumb staircase, I hate it. I ran along it when I was a small girl, now I walk Uh, as an adult after, and after all, they will carry me down when I die from the fifth floor in a coffin and it will still be depressing and boring. I hate it. Потом мы уехали в другую страну. Перед тем, как покинуть свой дом навсегда, навсегда, я поменяла имя, фамилию, национальность, переписала свой паспорт. Я хотела измениться абсолютно, прыгнуть в неизвестность, лишь бы парашют не подвел. Then we, then we moved to another country. Before I left my home forever, I changed my name, surname, and nationality. I rewrote my passport. I wanted to change completely, to make a jump into the unknown. Hopefully, the parachute will not fail. Четыре года на новом месте я как будто и не жила. Я попала в турбулентность и замерла в ней, как муха в янтаре. Я висела, будто спиленутая с трупами парашюта, железного парашюта. Я потеряла все, имя, фамилию, национальность, работу, очки, родину, другие книги. Я много писала тогда, и это были горькие рассказы, но иногда смешные, потому что только смех спасал меня в той черной дыре. Four years in a new place I did not seem to live. I got into turbulence and froze, and frozen it like a fly in amber. I hung like swaddled in the parachute slings. I ran parachute. I lost everything. Name, surname, nationality, work, glasses, homeland, friends, books. I wrote a lot then, and these were bitter stories. But sometimes funny because our because only laughter could save me in that black reality. А потом мы вернулись в тот же дом, в ту же квартиру. И когда я ступила на ту самую лестницу, я заплакала. Мне хотелось ее целовать. Я думала, боже, какое счастье, ура! Я тут бегала с девочкой, а теперь я взрослая и могу по ней ходить. Меня даже хранить понесут по этой моей любимой, замечательной, гулкой и мрачной лестнице. Какая я счастлива. And when I stepped onto that very staircase, I cried. I wanted to kiss it. I thought, my God, what a happiness. I ran here as a girl and now I'm an adult and I can walk on it. And they will even carry me to, the, uh, to be buried along this beloved, wonderful, echoing and gloomy staircase. How happy I am. Я по-прежнему с пеленными стропами, и мой железный парашют никуда не делся. На нем написано любовь, и эта любовь тяжела. На нем написано родина, и эта родина не всегда кажется родной. Когда-нибудь мой парашют меня раздавит. А когда это будет? Зато мне начал нравиться мой неспешный полет. А писать книги для детей оказалось так здорово, так бесконечно интересно, что я уже не боюсь высоты. Хоть пятый этаж, хоть стратосфера, мне все. I'm still swaddled in slings and my iron parachute hasn't gone anywhere. It says love and that love is heavy. It says homeland and this homeland doesn't always seem native. Someday my parachute will crush me, someday. However, I began to like my unhurried, uh, unhurried flight. Writing books for children turned out to be so great, so infinitely interesting that I am no longer afraid of hates. Even the fifth floor, even the stratosphere. I don't care. Немножко может быть видно, но зато сам текст будет небольшим. Я могу уже читать, да? Или сначала... So, I start... Shall I start my excerpt? Yes, go ahead. 
Угу, да, да, да. Да, начинайте, Лиля. Лестница. Эта лестница помнит все. Белые гольфики с желтыми туфельками, черные чулки с лодочками, джинсы с кроссовками, брюки с ботинками, сливочные туфли на высоком каблуке, потом белоснежные, ажурные туфельки. Далее демисезонные, коричневые, коричневые ресторанные, лаковые, уродливые, тесные, мягкие, замшевые типа макосины и, наконец, туфли ортопедические. Ритм тоже менялся. Дробное перестукивание, перескоки через ступеньки, изящное скольжение, мелькание, ча-ча-ча. Теперь ровнее, ровнее, медленнее, спокойнее, теперь осторожнее. Усталость, вены, спотыкание, шаг, остановка, два шага, одышка, три шага, аритмия. Эхо затихает, капая звуками в пролет, как гигантская сосуд. Тишина. Вдруг много-много чужих шагов. И несут что-то тяжелое, угловатое, огромное что-то. Ящик с картошкой. Нет-нет, не с картошкой. Оно внутри переваливается на повороты. Иногда несущие замирают и молча дышат, слушая стуки своих живых сердец. White knee socks and darling little yellow shoes, black stockings and serious pumps, jeans and sneakers, trousers and ankle boots, cream colored high heels, then snow white, lacy, one of a kind. Later, mid season, practical, brown, patent leather for going out, obnoxious and too tight. Suede, soft suede slip ons like moccasins and finally orthopedic and safe. The rhythm has changed as well. Percussive wrappings, two steps at a time, elegant glides, a flickering cha cha cha. Now much more even, slower, calmer, now more careful. Wariness, veins, tripping, a step and a stop, two steps and out of breath, three steps and arrhythmia sets in. The echo dies away, dripping sounds down the stairwell like a gigantic icicle. Silence. Suddenly many, many unfamiliar footfalls and they are carrying something heavy, angular, something enormous, a box of potatoes, no, No, not a potato as it lurches inside when they turn corners. Sometimes those bearing the box freeze and breathe, unspeaking, listening to the beat of their own living hearts. Спасибо. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lilia, and thank you, Aral, for helping. Спасибо всем за то, что слушали. Thank you. The last of our lovely writers um, that we're highlighting tonight is Asal Omar, um, who just got her camera working. Yay! <laughs> We can see you. Oh, Asal, is it? I'll, uh, Asal, I'll, go ahead. I'll, I'll tell everybody a little bit about you, and then we'll turn the microphone over to you. So it was, um, it was a pleasure to, to listen to uh, Oral. I enjoy her Kazakh pronunciation because I, I'm far away from Kazakhstan now. Uh, I'm in Turkey, Antalya. Uh, so uh, I've been living in Moscow for 30 last years. So I'm in Moscow <laughs> actually, but I was born in Almaty. So uh, I better read in English or in Russian. What do you think? I think whatever you like, maybe a little bit of Um, well, maybe just English, because we've heard Russian now and we've heard Kazakh, so okay. maybe just English. As you please. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to thank um, G and Singapore and Bounce for support, because it was really support, and I remember, still remember our publication, collective publication on poems on January 2022. Um, it was a big support, and I appreciate Shelley translated it, and uh, Singapore Unbound published it. It was great, really. And um, I also appreciate uh, the Shelley's uh, introduction to our book uh, because it was a, a great, really, uh, Kazakhstan history in short. And it, it, it is pretty updated. I mean, also January 22 uh, was noticed there, mentioned in this introduction. I think it is important to uh, let American readers know what is going on in Kazakhstan today. Uh, and um, I have a text a little bit I'd like to share. Uh, it is a piece of uh, French beret story. 
Her eyes met his, her lashes flashed as if she were glad to see him and she walked closer. Do you remember my brother, Islam Kinjegaliv? No, he said. Do you remember me? She asked, anticipation in her voice. No. Here, this is for you, she said. And without another word, she held out a small box perched on the palm of her hand. No, I couldn't. What's your name? Said Vakas Absatarov. Thank you, she said. And she put the box, the box down on the railing. How is your brother? Asked the old man. He's fine, praise God. He has six children. And she hurried away, waving goodbye. The old man opened the box. Inside there was a gold wristwatch. The black car disappeared around the corner. The major watched it go and went back upstairs to his office. It was a little bit about uh, Stalin's repressions and uh, why I choose this piece of text to share. Uh, because I think that every name we lost in the repressions and every name uh, which are in trouble today during the protest, during the uh, political circumstances, every name is very important uh, to remember, to help, to support. And uh, I believe that also every name uh, of people who are guilty in these uh, repressions in the past and now, it is also remember, remembered and it is important to know them. Because we, uh, uh, till now, since Soviet time, every family know the name of the informers or KGB agents who repressed members of our families. And till now we have uh, our um, top secret files of KGB of past time. It's still top secret because a lot of people we have around today uh, who are guilty in the repressions. Uh, I know the experience of Latvia, for example. Uh, they opened um, top secret files of KGB and uh, it's look, it looks like uh, a tragedy because uh, uh, they can see today, for example, their neighbor, uh, they say hello every day, and they uh, found out that this is the ex-informer of KGB, <laughs> and they have to live with it, how to deal with it. And, but I think, I think this is very important today, significantly important to overcome our tragic past and go forward with optimism. <laughs> And uh, it is important not to repeat that, uh, not to let such a things come back to our life. Uh, so if you have any questions, or I have my question to you in chat, if you'd like to answer, I appreciate it. Thanks, Asel. Yeah, I think we'll let uh, Naomi kind of start off the conversation here. And we'll answer all the questions. <laughs> okay. Yes. Um, thank you, everybody. Uh, sorry, Naomi, I guess I forgot to introduce you earlier on. So please let me do the honors. And then, of course, I'll let you uh, take over. All right, everybody, thank you so much, all, uh, you know, Shelly and all our writers, for your wonderful, wonderful uh, readings. Can't wait to hear the conversation uh, that's going to follow. And that conversation will be moderated by Naomi Cathy. Naomi is an assistant professor of Russian and humanities at Reed College. Her recent publications on Central Asian literature include Between First, Second, and Third Worlds, Ozas Sulaimanov and Soviet Postcolonialism, 1961 to 1973, and How Tatiana's Voice Rang Across the Step, Russian Literature in the Life and Legend of Abai. She's also a co-editor of Tulips in Bloom, a forthcoming anthology of Central Asian literature in translation, currently under contract with Palgrave. That sounds really exciting, Naomi. Maybe you would like say a few words about that as well. But over to you now. 
Okay, can everybody hear me all right? Yes. Okay, yeah, I'm joining you from Batumi, Georgia on a balcony oh. in the middle of the night and there's a rave going on in the park across the street from where I am. So I'm <laughs> especially oh. concerned that you can hear me. Uh, but anyway, before we jump into the q and I actually have prepared some remarks uh, and I'm just gonna go through them really quickly and then we'll get uh, we'll get to some of these questions. And I have a few questions of my own for the for the writers and translators as well. Um, the first thing that I wanna say is that the book, um, this book has made a real splash in my world. Uh, pretty much everyone I know in Central Asian literary studies is talking about it. Um, and I feel so fortunate to have uh, so many brilliant friends and colleagues that are among the contributors. So once again, just congratulations. Uh, to everybody who is involved in this wonderful project. Um, and I wanted to talk about one thing in particular. Uh, the other day, I um, attended a talk in Tbilisi, Georgia, by the Turkish-American novelist Elif Batuman. And a lot of what she said was really resonating with me as I was reading this anthology and getting ready for um, our meeting today. Uh, so the topic of Elif Batman's talk was uh, reading canonical Russian literature like Tolstoy and Dostoevsky in the context of Russia's war against Ukraine and in the broader context of Russian imperialism and its legacy in the world today. Um, and this had me thinking a lot about the relationship of literary canons to power and money and imperial conquest and nation building. Um, and one of the points that came up in the discussion with Elif Batuman uh, that really stuck with me was this notion that the production of literature requires certain kinds of surplus. Uh, so like in order to be a writer, you need free time, you need space of your own and money. And these things are luxuries that are often only available to people who are at the top of the social hierarchy, which is how we get war and peace. Um, so it's typically educated, you know, well-connected, high-status men who have the power to set the parameters for what literature should be. They're the ones who decide what kinds of things we should write about and how it should be done. Um, which writers are worthy of being studied at school and university? Um, which ones are worth naming streets and parks after or worthy of uh, being translated into other languages? Um, and also which writers and which works are the most representative of a national tradition or whose works embody or reflect the defining qualities of a people. And it occurs to me that this is exactly the kind of work that an anthology is supposed to do. Um, anthologies are purporting to bring together the most representative works of a particular canon um, and so they're like tools for canon building. And that's exactly what excites me more than anything else uh, about the anthology Amanat. It's this, this fact that it comes as a kind of provocation to this uh, top-down kind of male-dominated canon building. It throws a wrench in it. Um, so by showcasing contemporary women writers from such a diverse range of cultural and linguistic backgrounds, um, writing styles and genre orientations, um, Amanat kind of upends what we think we know about post-Soviet Kazakhstani literature. Uh, and it also overturns what we think we know about the Kazakh or the Kazakhstani experience. Um, and I see this as one of the key voice, key functions of the, the voices that we hear in this anthology. Um, all of these voices that typically um, we, we don't think of as being associated with canonical literature. Uh, these grandmothers, aunties, women executives, uh, wives of Dombra players, uh, homeless children young research assistants who are frustrated by the inequalities of academia. I have to say that I relate to that one in particular. <laughs> um, all of these different voices are representing Kazakhstan and the Kazakhstani experience, but in their own way. Um, and the other thing that I found so interesting with, relate, with relation to this notion of canon building is um, how many of these stories uh, are engaging directly with canonical literature around the world or entering into dialogue. 
uh, with classic writers. For example, um, Aigul Kamilbaeva's story, Hunger, uh, the main character's intellectual landscape is spanning European and American classics, uh, Kazakh folk wisdom, and Russian classics like Gogol, Pushkin, and Turgenev. Um, in Asiel Amar's story, Black Snow of December, which chronicles the events of the 1986 Joltaksan uprising, um, these are narrated with literary references. So we have James Joyce and Chinggis Aitmatov juxtaposed with uh, the Kazakh poet and victim of Soviet terror, uh, Shakarim Kudai Verdiev, uh, whose works were banned throughout the Soviet era and only resurfaced during uh, Perestroika and the post-Soviet era. Um, so in the end, I think the real innovation and one of the real innovations and significant contributions of Amanat is that it shows us these new possibilities for thinking more expansively about literary canons. Um, and I find this thought provoking as a reader and as somebody who loves Central Asian literature, um, but also as a teacher of literature, uh, because these are exactly the kinds of things that I try to teach my students in, liter in literature classes, no matter what the content is. Uh, so thank you so much for that too. Uh, and now, we'll get into the Q&A. Um, and I guess I'll just uh, take advantage of the fact that I have the floor to ask my own questions right now. Um, I'm reminded of Zaure's message to the audience today, which Shelley read for us. Um, May this anthology find its audience. Um, so my question to, uh, to everyone is, uh, could you speak a little bit about the challenges of rendering the literature of Kazakhstan legible to an English speaking audience? Um, what were maybe some of the challenges or highlights of this journey towards finding an audience? Uh, and I don't know, maybe uh, Shelly, do you wanna get us started and we can jump in as, as we wish? Okay. Yeah, this sounds like a good question for me. Um, yeah. I guess, I mean, every translation project and, and publishing project has its own kind of obstacles to overcome and so on. But I, I think the main thing I wanna say about it is that finding an audience for Kazakh literature, Central Asian literature is not as difficult as you might think um, because it's not as strange a thing as you might think. Um, we don't know a lot about Central Asia here in the United States. We don't know a lot about Kazakhstan. We've maybe never read anything from there before. But when you do open a book like Amanat or um, a few of the other ones that have been published recently, you quickly find out that, oh, these are people, it turns out, living in this country. <laughs> and they have problems like people have and they tell stories like people tell. Um, so while it might seem like a, you know, a, a very rare thing, a very exotic set of things to talk about, in the end, it's just um, such a human collection of stories. And I think that actually the diversity in, in Amanat helps with that as well, because we have uh, writing from older women, younger women, um, writing about characters who are destitute and characters who are, um, you know, well on their way up the corporate ladder and, and everybody in between. Um, so there's something in here for every reader, I think. So I think, uh, you know, finding an audience will, um, will not be difficult once, you know, now that the book is out in the world and people are talking about it. I'm excited to see, to see who finds it. Does anybody else want to add to this question about uh, finding an audience? Uh, and if not, we can proceed to um, we can proceed to on down the line. Uh, I wonder okay. if I can just add a small note to that. Of course, yeah. Um, of course, you're talking about finding an audience for uh, for these stories. Well, the thing is that all kinds of English readers, mm -hmm. if you're talking about English readers in North America, uh, I probably have less to say, although interestingly, there's more translated into English for Americans than there is necessarily for people, other English uh, speakers and readers in other parts of the world. But I'm sure somebody in Africa is is likely to read something like this if it were available. And, and certainly in India, I would say this would be very available. Well, ex I think it would be easy to read this actually. Uh, there's something about the cultural context that really helps actually, the fact that it's not North American. 
is just makes it more accessible, even though the language used to communicate is English. So I think people relate to the cultural context. Uh, Radhika, thanks for, for inserting that. I remember um, a conversation you and I had about the title. So um, Radhika even recognized the, the title word Amanat. So it's not just a Kazakh word, right? Yeah. Yeah, I was actually having some interesting conversations with some colleagues who speak other Turkic languages uh, about the different shades of meaning that Amanat has kind of across just the Turkic speaking world, not to mention, you know, some of the other languages where it's a part of the culture. So that's that that was kind of cool to me. Um, and also just uh, along the, with this point, Shelley, I also really admire in your translations the ways in which you don't make everything completely easy for the reader. Uh, you don't let the reader forget that they're reading Kazakhstani literature. And so um, I just uh, really was struck by the way that some uh, Kazakh expressions and some like key concepts are left not totally explained to the reader, but with enough space for the reader to understand what's, what's, uh, what it might mean through the context. And it kind of forces the reader to do this interpretive work. Um, and this, so uh, this is related to Asiel's question that she posed in the chat for everyone, uh, which is uh, to Shelley and G, what was the most complicated thing for American and Singaporean readers to understand in the text? I haven't heard any any complaints yet, but maybe G, um, maybe you can talk from the the publisher's point of view as you were considering this, um, what you thought uh, kind of the market would be like and the reception might be like. That'd be interesting for me to hear too. Yeah, sure. Um, I have not heard um, you know directly from any Singaporean readers uh, yet. You know, I'm sure we will uh, as the book you know makes its way out into the world. But I myself, of course, would consider myself a Singaporean reader <laughs> of Amanat. And certainly, you know, I have shared with, you know, Shelly and Zaurua, what are some of the uh, themes in Amanat that they really, I think, would appeal to me as a Singaporean reader and other Singaporean readers. The fact that, you know, both societies are in some ways post-colonial societies. Of course, the colonizing, you know, forces are very different. But Singapore, of course, was also a colony of uh, Great yeah. Britain. So we too struggle with, you know, what language do we use? Do we use English, the language of our colonizer, or do we reject it for something more local? As I see, you know, uh, perhaps a kind of dilemma or, or, or at least a question to be grappled with uh, for Kazakhstani writers, right? Whether to write in Russian or to write in Kazakh, right? It's always seems to be a, it's going to be a perennial question <laughs> as it is for you know Singapore literature. But as I was also you know listening to everybody, and I'm so glad for that uh, uh, guest who talked about how you know not all the English language you know readers are found in North America. They too are found in you know Singapore, and I'm thinking you know, even we our image of Singapore is that it's such a highly urbanized country, right? It's a very small country and. There's little countryside, whatever little countryside we have has been turned into the city. Uh, oh. But we do remember even like our great grand, our grandparents who remember living in villages in this small island and how they have been changed into uh, urban you know, areas. And that too seems to be a major theme in the anthology, the move from a completely rural lifestyle you know, to a much more urban uh, lifestyle and the shock maybe even trauma of that move. I think it's something that, you know, many Singaporeans still remember and will certainly uh, respond to. Uh, so I, I, I expect, you know, uh, Singaporeans to respond to it in many more ways than I've just described, but those were a few ways they could. Okay, thank you. And um, just a small notice, uh, we see in Kazakhstan if it, so much billions of dollars uh, wouldn't be stolen from Kazakhstan. Kazakhstan could look like Singapore, like a country yeah. of 20th century. <laughs> and uh, I, I'm afraid, what do you think? I'd like to share my thought. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, the translator uh, uh, share uh, the historical or some um, specific uh, things, but sometimes 
uh, it, it's hard to uh, notice uh, some things. It, it is usually it's not a, a fault. For example, I I like uh, I try to show uh, uh, that how the name of my uh, personage uh, of my character uh, could play its role. For example. Uh, uh, as in French Beret story, uh, the name of the hero was Islam Kenji Galif. Islam uh, is the name which means religion. And uh, at the same time, he was a Komsomolets who is a member of uh, young communist uh, Komsomolets, what, who is a Komsomolets, you, you know. Uh, so it uh, uh, sounds uh, pretty ridiculous. Uh, Komsomolets, Islam Kenji Galif, it's controversial words coming together. I, I just use it. To show the uh, controversial time we had. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I also want to add about the uh, names <clears throat> in, in my story. Uh, <clears throat> in the story Amanat, um, the name of one of the sons is Jalgas. And in Kazakh, Jalgas means continuation. And in Kazakh tradition, uh, the youngest son should live in the parents' house. He should marry and he, he should support this house This because this is the main house for the family. That's why uh, the, character, the character of my story, Myra, the old woman wants Jalgas to come, the youngest son. She wants him to live in her house. And that's why she gives this like um, order or mandate um, uh, trust uh, to, uh, to her uh, older son. She wants her younger son to live in her house. <laughs> so, the, so and, um, uh, and there was a question, what is Amanat? Uh, as Shelley already wrote somewhere, uh, Amanat has many meanings and uh, one of them is sacred trust. Uh, this is um, uh, when the um, older generation gives an order to the youngest generation to continue something. And in Kazakh tradition, this is very important word. If my mother and my father left something to do for me, Amanat, I should do that. Otherwise, this will be uh, this will be very, very how to say it. <laughs> Um, this will be very difficult for me. I can't live without that. This is the most important thing. That's why she uh, she wanted the youngest son to marry another woman. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, while we're on this topic of um, aspects of Kazakh traditional culture, we had two questions that were along those lines. Um, G asks, uh, mm -hmm. if th how the oral storytelling tradition um, has possibly influenced your writing. And I think this is a question to all of the authors. And we have another related question, which is, what is the most famous Kazakh saying or adage? Um, and this, this, uh, this person also notes that uh, there were so many Kazakh uh, sayings woven into the stories and I also made a note of like all of my favorite Kazakh sayings from the anthology as I was reading along uh, I especially like the one about the plate uh, so the plate may get old the paint on the plate may get older but the plate still has serves its purpose uh, about aging uh, but I, I would be curious to hear from you all, authors and translators, uh, relationship to, about your thoughts about the relationship to the oral tradition and Kazakh folk wisdoms or sayings. Um, about the question um, on oral um, tradition, it's it's very important for uh, mainly for Kazakh writer for Kazakh writers for Kazakh speaking people, because we are all grown up on this tradition. When I was a small girl, uh, people come to my house, uh, uh, to friends of my grandfather and grandmother, and they told stories, and I listened to them all the. All the children uh, in the Kazakh speaking 
<laughs> environment. They are, they are used to listen to these stories. And uh, I knew some of them by heart. These are stories coming from the 17th, 16th uh, centuries. And I think they do uh, influence our writing. Of course, yeah. <laughs> there are a few stories in the anthology that really kind of literally convey this oral storytelling tradition too. So I'm thinking of Asal's uh, longer story, Black Snow of December, um, is almost stream of consciousness going, goes back in time and uh, the character kind of relives his experience as a boy um, during this time of um, kind of terrifying uh, violence and unrest in Almaty. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, it's almost telling a story then I think, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me, let me to translate for Lila the questions. Yeah. Lila, там было несколько вопросов. Вот один из вопросов на насколько э, важна э, вот эта устная традиция казахская для писателей влияет ли она на творчество. А потом э, Науми спрашивала, какие есть пословицы, да, поговорки казахские, ну важные для писателей. Вот. Ну, мне сложно ответить на эти вопросы, как вы понимаете. Да, для Лили сложно. Но, да. но, но учитывая, что мы уже несколько лет с Зирой работаем над нашей эпопеей вот, в области детской литературы, мы как раз в наших историях об Ату и его друзьях как раз используем и традиции устной речи, и, конечно, поговорки. Более того, вот, в самой первой книге Собственно, завязка первой книги о приключениях Бату и его друзей а, состоит в том, что вот мальчик Бату, матинец, он встречается с золотым человеком, принцем Масадетов, а с порой. И встречается он благодаря тому, что он садится на порог. И там звучит вот эта вот поговорка, нельзя сидеть на пороге. А, бабушка ему говорит об этом все время, но Бату не понимает смысла этой поговорки. И э, он раскрывается, когда благодаря вот этому его пребыванию на пороге к нему сходит с обложки дневника «Золотой человек». И оказывается, что любой порог – это может быть порог не только между двумя комнатами да, или домом, и, mm -hmm. но и порог между двумя мирами. Mm -hmm. Поэтому yeah. нельзя, нельзя задерживаться на пороге, иначе э, можно попасть в другой мир, ну или, соответственно, другой мир может попасть в тебе. Почему я об этом спрашиваю? Благодаря этой поговорке мы нашли спонсора в свое время, потому что одна женщина прочитала вот, вот эту вот повесть, она написала нам, что наконец-то она поняла смысл этой поговорки, которую с детства ей бабушка, которая в детстве бабушка все время повторяла, и поэтому она хочет, чтобы все тоже об этом узнали, ей очень понравилось вот этот подход через поговорки, через устную речь выход как бы ну, в народное творчество, а самое главное в мифологию. И поэтому она нам дала деньги на издание первой книги. Uh, let me translate, Lila. Um, uh, I asked the same questions to Lila, I translated them, and she says that it's difficult for her to decide, she is not Kazakh speaking, so, but uh, she is working on um, uh, on um, stories for kids, for children, with Zaurya Nauruzbaeva, the stories of Batu. And they use a lot of um, Kazakh sayings and Kazakh traditions. And even through these uh, stories, they explain to children uh, our some of our traditions. For example, um, uh, Asil, как будет порог? Порог. Threshold. Uh, Threshold, entry. Threshold. Uh, this is uh, this is a place between two uh, two rooms at the door. At the door. So there is a saying in Kazakh that uh, you shouldn't sit there. You shouldn't stay there. And uh, in one of the stories, Lila, Lila and Zira describe that why it sh they shouldn't stand there or stay there because uh, this is uh, um, like a place between two two worlds. It's always something my my mystical in it. Um, and some people um, were grateful to Lila and Zira for explaining that. 
And um, Lilia says that they use a lot of such things uh, with Zira um, uh, in their stories about Batu. Uh, a lot of things from mythology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's absolutely fascinating. Um, and we had another question about language, uh, yeah. speaking of uh -huh. this kind of thing. Um, Aisha asks if the authors could talk about their language choices um, and what guided their decisions to write either in Kazakh or Russian or both. <laughs> It was it wasn't a choice. It, it was just choice. circumstances. Yeah. Can you uh, elaborate on that? I would be interested, Asil, to hear more about that because I've heard this answer uh, from a lot of writers who I ask this question. I'll translate for Lilia. Lilia, был вопрос о том, что вот мы, например, кто пишет на казахском и на русском, как вы выбираете язык. Да, вот. Когда Я сказала, вы что мы не выбирали. Да, да, да. Асиль скажет, что не выбирали. выбор, на самом деле. Да, да, да. Uh, I think this question relates to me because I write, I write in Kazakh and Russian. And uh, the story, the story... Oral, I'm oral, not... just a second, sorry, oral. Uh, oral is unique because she is bilingual. Uh, so... I'm not. <laughs> Можно пару слов тоже сказать? Конечно, конечно. Я не знаю, в ходе дискуссии упоминалось ли, что одно из значений слова «аманат» – заложник. Заложник, как будет на английском «заложник», кто скажет? Hostage. Одно из значений этого слова «заложник» – как правило, это человек, которого забирают в плен для того, чтобы а, определить да, да, да. Ну, толерантность да, противоположной стороны, то есть чтобы не случилось войны, да, он как заложник мира. И угу. если продолжать, если как бы, ну, взять эту аналогию, казахский язык, как и языки многих союзных республик, бывших советов, а, и в том числе литература, они как бы в свое время стали заложниками русского языка и русской культуры. Mm. А в этом mm -hmm. были свои плюсы, в этом были свои минусы, но плюсы прежде всего в том, что через русский язык как бы, шло подключение к мировой литературе. Да? Mm -hmm. ну, mm -hmm. потому, что не, потому что не было никакого другого подключения. Естественно, yeah. да. Mm -hmm. а, ну, в той политической ситуации, скажем так, может быть, казахи и мечтали бы подключиться через Китай, например, или через Турцию, но как бы ситуация была не так. Ну, при чем тут Китай или Турция вообще? Это могло бы быть совершенно по-другому? Это могло бы быть совершенно по-другому. Это я сказала просто для примера. Без каких-либо конфликтов. Лиля told about the... О, uh, сори, oh, Лиля, говорите. Нет, я все практически закончила. Я просто хотела сказать, что эта ситуация сейчас уже выглядит по-другому. И, к счастью, mm -hmm. сейчас уже... Люди, пишущие на казахском языке, не обязаны совершенно ориентироваться на русскую литературу, на русский язык. И это очень хорошая новость. Да? Mm -hmm. С другой mm -hmm. стороны, в Казахстане осталось много людей, и я к ним тоже принадлежу, которые не владеют ни, ни казахским, ни английским языком. Им остался только вот этот маленький кусочек, маленький остров русского языка, который, в общем, к России даже отношения тоже не имеет. И мы как такие Робинзоны Круза там сидим на этом острове. У нас нет выбора. Но в этом есть своя прелесть тоже. Когда у тебя нет выбора, ты используешь этот шанс до конца. Преимущество Казахстана, я думаю, в этом мультикультурализме, в этом билингвизме. Мультикультурализм Казахстана – это наш преимущество, как мы можем видеть. We can use all the cultural <laughs> advantages of two languages. Uh, and uh, now it, it, a lot of writers uh, younger than me and, uh, or about our generation um, and oral knows it, uh, uh, translate each other from Russian to Kazakh mm. and otherwise. Yeah. Because yeah. we'd like to share, we, because we understand our identity as Kazakhstanians. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Both Russians, Ukrainians, Kazakhs, and others, and others. We have a uh, hundred nations here, uh, about a hundred nations yeah. in Kazakhstan. So yeah. uh, this cultural experience is pretty unique for us, and I, I appreciate it, for example. And yeah. I appreciate this sharing, cultural yeah. um, sharing of texts and translations. Uh, yeah. Oral yeah, is also a translator, and uh, what is good about uh, um, cooperation of Lilia and Zira, they can use both languages for their creati yeah. creativity. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. I like and, and I would just add that I absolutely love, one of the things that I also love about this anthology is the fact that it includes works from both Russian and Kazakh, because typically, I don't see works from these two strains in Kazakhstani writing together. So I don't often have the opportunity to read the to read works together and in conversation with one another. And that's one of the wonderful things that this has this anthology has enabled us to do. Um, and it's uh, it's exciting to me also to see uh, more and more translations between Kazakh and Russian and bilingual publications and so on. Uh, mm -hmm. Oral, uh, I, would you speak uh, a little bit about your experience as a bilingual writer mm -hmm. and um, what, that, mm -hmm. what that means to you? <laughs> uh, you know, I don't know uh, how I choose the language, but now I thought about that and I understood, I think. Um, I wrote uh, the story Amanat uh, after I came from my home village, Aul, where everybody speaks Kazakh. So it was easier for me to write Kazakh after that. <laughs> so when I'm in Kazakh environment, it's easier for me to write Kazakh. When I'm in, in a Russian environment, uh, in the, uh, among Russian speaking people, I mean, it's easier for me uh, to, to write Russian. And I, I studied in the Russian school uh, because there were not so many Kazakh schools. But when I went to the first grade to the Russian school, I couldn't speak any word in Russian. And everybody was laughing on me because I couldn't speak Russian. <laughs> so, uh, oh, you, you didn't know, you didn't know no, Russian? No, I, I knew no, no word in Russian when I went I'm to school. I'm surprised. Yeah, no, really. Not. Because no, I'm from a native Russian speaker. Uh, thank you. Uh, because I studied in uh, in Russian school, so I went to Russian school, and at home we always spoke Kazakh. That was a, a, a rule. Uh, my father wouldn't let us speak Russian whole, at home. So that was the rule. And we had a lot of books in Russian and Kazakh. It was, uh, and it was no difference for me uh to read this uh, sometimes i didn't even notice whether it's kazakh or russian uh, so and um, and i never i never studied kazakh as a linguist or because in russian school we had some lessons of kazakh but um, uh, this was not so strict or it was just formality and uh, for short time the same in the university. So I know Kazakh because um, my family at home was Kazakh speaking and because mm -hmm. I read a lot in Kazakh. So, and um, sometimes it's easier for me to write Russian because it will be uh, translated easier because it takes less time for me sometimes. Yeah, because I have more, uh, I, I have more audience uh, yeah, in, yeah. in Russian. And uh, uh, at the beginning, I started to write in, um, in Kazakh, but I couldn't find any place to publish my stories or my poems. Uh, this, oh, was a, oh. this was a problem. Uh, but when I yeah. write in Russian, I can place it everywhere, maybe because of my environment. And uh, we in Kazakhstan have two literatures, Kazakh literature and Russian literature, and they are very different um, uh, because these are two cultural, two cultural uh, worlds. <laughs> so, uh, thank you, so, thank you so much, Aro. Uh, May I ask a question? 
Yes, yes, please. Yes, quickly, uh, because oh, yes, very quickly. We're running out of time, but yes, absolutely. Last question. Okay, very quickly. Yeah. So I saw Shelley's uh, comment that Orel's Russian language poetry always includes Kazakh words. So my question is uh, then, uh, Shelley, did you translate any of the poems? Yes, I've done a few. Yeah. So in that case, when you translate, what do you do? Because you've got you're translating. Yeah, I, I'm. I, it's quite interesting to see what would happen, right? Yeah. So usually, I'll um. In this case, gosh, I can't promise you this is true because I have a feeling I make this decision no. for the first time every time. Mm -hmm. But I think often what I end up doing is um leaving the Kazakh words in Kazakh, mm. um because uh, having them kind of embedded in a mostly Russian poem kind of singles them out as as foreign words as a different type of word. So I'll keep them, you know, I'll, I'll let them retain that difference in, in English as being Kazakh words. And then there's the question then of whether to explain that or not explain it or hope people can figure it out for themselves. But it is different for every translation and every poem. But it's one of the great things about translating um, Oral and, and her kind of unique way of thinking. Thank you. All right. Well, I want to once again uh, thank all of our speakers and thank you so much uh, to those of you in the audience for asking all of these great questions to spur along our discussion. And I will give the microphone back to G at this time for closing remarks. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Naomi, for, you know, for first of all, your remarks. I mean, the remarks are remarkable. I love them about what you said about, you know, Alif uh, Batuman's, uh, you know, ideas and how they actually apply to this uh, anthology. Amana, thank you so much for those very thoughtful remarks and for moderating the conversation in such a way that, you know, everybody has a chance to say something, including, you know, members of our audience. And of course, a really, really big thank you to our writers, uh, Lilia, Asel, Oral, you know, for reading your work. I mean, I have been reading them on the page, but it's really nothing like hearing it in your voice, in the original languages, as well as in translation. So thank you so much. Uh, for you know doing the readings and for engaging with these conversations uh, at uh, such a serious and also humorous way I love it too and of <laughs> course to Shelley you know who the translator uh, uh, and, and a participant at this uh, 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 event you know always playing the role of facilitator whether it's like adding additional explanatory remarks in chat or you know adding in some context that we need I mean because after all the translator is in so many ways a facilitator of sorts as well. I take away from this conversation the whole the Kazakh saying never stay on the threshold. So I invite <laughs> every one of you to enter into the room of the anthology Amanat, avail yourself of a copy and stay there in this house with many, many rooms, many, many stories and enjoy staying there for a while, you know, feel it, hear it, smell it, listen to it, because, you know, all these writers have created those rooms just for you. But I also do want to say thresholds are so fascinating because they are so forbidden. And, you know, to me, translation too is a kind of threshold, right? Because thresholds join as well as divide, right? And so translations play that function, as does this virtual meeting. We are not in the same room with one another, but nevertheless, through technology, the mysticism of technology, the magic of technology, yeah. <laughs> we're able to stay on this threshold for this wonderful 90 minutes <laughs> together from all over the world. I mean, that is great. I mean, that is how technology should be used, isn't it? To actually build that connections, right, between all of us. So thank you so much uh, to all our guests for attending this event. Thank you so much to all our participants. You have really, really made this a very special event. And to usher you off, uh, we will actually play another piece of music suggested by our editor. Uh, uh, and it is a piece of uh, Zaura Batayeva. And it is a piece of contemporary uh, music this time uh, called White Rain by the contemporary composer, Satan Turizbek. Uh, I hope I, I'm probably mangling the name, I'm sorry about that. Uh, but I thought it'd be really nice to hear another piece of uh, music uh, displaying you know, the uh, versatility of the Dombira uh, musical instrument. All right, thank you everybody for actually you know, coming to this event and I hope you enjoy this music.
all right, and take it away with you. Uh, let me just uh, do this correctly. Hmm. <clears throat> Uh, I don't it, hear anything. It's just muted, I'm afraid. I'm afraid. It looks nice though. Can you hear yeah. it now? Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Thank you everyone for joining us uh, for this event. As you go on your way, uh, please take care of yourselves, be well. And I guess, I hope uh, our paths will meet again before too long. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you everyone. Thank, Thank you. you for the amazing conversation. I'm happy. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for this event. Yeah. Take care. <laughs>